Hello, my name is Lydia and my friend is Anjar. Here, we would like to present our final assignment of pragmatic subject, especially in implicature subfield. Next, we will show you some movies. There are Emily in Paris, Bridgerton, and The Queen's Gambit, which we took from Netflix. These movies are popular for Netflix users. We believe you have watched these movies. And another well-known movie is an episode from France. Okay, before we start, we will convey some theories about the meaning of implicature and related things. So, uh, implicature is a component of speaker meaning that constitutes an aspect of what is meant in a speaker's utterance without being part of what it said. According to Grice, there are two types of implicature, conventional and conversational. To make people achieve effective conversational communication in common social situations, both speaker and hearer have to comply with cooperative principle, which includes maximum of quality, maximum of quantity, maximum of relation, and maximum of manner. Meanwhile, talking about implicature cannot be separated from politeness theory, which may consist of positive or negative politeness, both on the record or off the record strategies. So, here are the videos to show you some examples to make those theories easier to understand. Enjoy! Come on out, honey. I'm telling you, you look good. Tell her she looks good. Tell her she looks good. <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> you look so good! I cannot believe I have to walk down the aisle in front of 200 people looking like something you drink when you're nauseous. <laughs> So don't. I don't see why we have to go to this thing anyway. It's your, your ex-fiancé's wedding. Because I promised Mindy I would. Yeah, well, you promised Barry you'd marry him. <laughs> Look, you guys, I have to go. I'm the maid of honor. And besides, you know what? I just need to be in a room again with these people and feel good about myself. <laughs> I'm sorry, we don't have your sheep. <laughs> well, we can see that there is conversational implicature example because what is meant by Rachel's friends are not part of what is explicitly said. Rose actually knows that Rachel's dress is oval, but he doesn't want to hurt her feelings, so he tries to convince himself that he won't say anything bad to her by repeating statement, tell her she looks good twice. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. We can see by Phoebe's reaction and her tone. She's laughing out loud. Though she says, oh my god, you look so good, but it is obvious for us that Phoebe thinks that Rachel's dress looks ridiculous. Even Rachel herself says the dress looks like something you drink when you're nauseous. And the last reaction from Chandler also shows conversational implicature. He's mocking her. His utterance shows that, for him, Rachel's dress looks so old-fashioned as in 19th century. Oh my god, I feel like Nicole Kidman in Moulin Rouge. You've got all of Paris at your feet. There is a wonderful cafe just down below. A friend of mine is the manager. Wow. So, ça va? It's good? Oui, oui. Très good, très wonderful. Great. <laughs> Are you hungry? Would you like to have a coffee or...? Oh, actually, I have to get to my office. Oh, maybe you want to have a drink tonight? I have a boyfriend. In Paris? In Chicago. So you don't have a boyfriend in Paris? <laughs> 
Can I just get my keys? You know, yeah, play? yeah. Um, my number is on the card if you need me for anything and in case you change your mind. I won't. Bye-bye <laughs> <laughs> now. Yeah. From the conversation, we can see conversational implicature example from Emily's response. She refuses Gil's invitation to have a drink by telling him that she has a boyfriend, instead of saying yes or no. After that, we can see conventional implicature example from Gil's response by saying, So you don't have a boyfriend in Paris? Because Gil speaks the truth that Emily literally doesn't have a boyfriend in Paris. But Emily's response by saying, can I just get my keys please, shows off the record strategy because she actually wants Gilles to get out of her place. But she chooses to say it indirectly, a negative politeness all at once because she says please in local language. The last one shows both on the record strategy because Emily says it directly that she won't need Gilles' number and ask him to leave. We can see from Emily's expression, oh my god, which shows excitement when eating the chocolate croissant. This is her first time ordering the croissant, so we analyze this as positive politeness because she wants to tell how delicious the croissant is. Do you want to have lunch? No, I'll have a cigarette. Uh, I have a bad stomach. I have a previous engagement. The scene shows Emily asking her boss and friends to have lunch together, but they refuse it politely. We analyze this as conversational implicature with off-the-record strategy because the reason why they refuse Emily's invitation is that they don't feel comfortable with Emily. They don't like her because they have different culture. Emily looks disappointed, but she tries to understand. She thinks that they really don't have time to have lunch outside together. Meanwhile, at the end of the video, we can see that Emily finds out herself that Sylvie, Luke, and Julian actually have lunch together at a restaurant, and Emily feels disappointed again. Emily from Savoir, how are you? I am good, thanks, Matthew. I was wondering if I could come by the atelier to discuss something with you and Pierre. He's working non-stop with Fashion Week so close. But I can meet you for a drink tonight if you'd like. Oh, I'm going to a gallery opening with some friends. Text me the address and I'll see you there. Instead of responding, no, you can, Matthew says indirectly that Pierre is working non-stop. It shows conversational implicature with of the record strategy because the hidden meaning is no, Emily cannot meet Pierre at the moment. And it is also an example of floating maxim of relation since Matthew's response is not relevant. For the next utterance, Matthew offers Emily to meet tonight, but Emily says that she's going to a gallery opening with some friends. Afterwards, Matthew tells Emily to text him the address 
of the gallery to see her there. Matthew's response shows on the record strategy because it is unambiguously expressed that he will meet Emily at the gallery, so he needs the address. It also complies with maxim of quantity rules because Matthew contributes the information as required. Small glasses. Oh, Burbrook. Tiny little things, are they not? The glasses, I suppose. Then the matter is settled. I'm not entirely sure the matter in which we discuss, my lord. You've always amused me, Miss Bridgerton, ever since I was a schoolboy and you were. All but five? My brother, he summons me. <laughs> I'd... Miss Bridgerton! A moment, please. <laughs> Miss Bridgerton! Oh. Pardon me. Forgive me. Oh, yes, I don't know it. Thank you. Tell me your name. Your name, sir. Am I honestly to believe you do not already know my name? If you desire an introduction, madam, I do believe accosting me to be the least civilized of ways. Accosting you? Truly, they will try anything. Sir, that is not... This is not... What is your name? Bassett. Bassett! Bridget, sir! Come here, old friend! I heard news of your father. Just take you, no longer Bassett. I shall always... Hastings! The Duke of Hastings, now known forevermore. The whole video shows that Daphne is trying to escape from a conversation with Lord Burbrook, whom she doesn't like and accidentally hits the Duke. To pretend that she is talking to the Duke while ignoring the guy whom chasing her, she is asking the Duke's name. The utterance of the Duke shows a conversational implicature with off-the-record strategy, because he even asks her back to her question, instead of telling her his name directly. The Duke doubts Daphne Bridgerton for not knowing who he really is. Such response obviously is flouting maxim of relation, because the Duke's answer is irrelevant. Actually, Daphne really doesn't know Simon is the Duke until she finds out that her brother calling him. How long does it take for a letter to arrive from Spain? Sir George is with the front line. It must be terribly difficult to get letters in and out. You must be patient. If your love is as great as your previous letter state, surely he will write back to you soon. Or perhaps even better, he's already making his way back to you here to come and take you home. Marina is waiting for a letter from her lover with a help from Penelope. When Penelope gives Marina a signal that there is no letter for her, Marina asks herself for how long a letter to arrive from Spain. Instead of answering Marina directly, Penelope contributes the information excessively. It is obviously floating maxim of quantity because Penelope should have answered with length time such as 3 months or else. above one station is an art form indeed. But Miss Daphne Bridgerton's advance from future duchess to possible princess is an achievement that even this jaded author must applaud. Is it true? Am I to be the sister of a princess? Calm yourself. I'm not yet engaged to the prince. Will you have to wear a crown? Perhaps for special occasions. But only if I should marry the prince. Will you have to learn brush? It is German, and perhaps, but only if I should marry the prince. Will you have to move to a castle far, far away? Should you not be off somewhere with your governess? I should. My governess has the very same questions as me. 
Daphne feels disturbed by Hyacinth because her sister is so fussy asking her many questions. So that's why Daphne doesn't respond Hyacinth directly. At the end of the scene, when Daphne closes the door, there is an utterance of Daphne that shows conversational implicature. Hyacinth is still asking a question to Daphne, but instead of answering her directly, Daphne tells her sister to be off with her governess, which means that Daphne wants Hyacinth to leave her. It is also floating maxim of relation since Daphne's answer is not relevant to Hyacinth's question. I should. I was, I was going to ask if you had tried drinking raw eggs and garlic. I hear it works wonders to rid yourself of the lingering effects. What were you going to say what? before you started to say something? Oh, I, I do not recall. Simon, look at me. At the beginning of the scene, both Daphne and Simon are trying to say something at the same time and creates an awkward moment. But eventually, Daphne continues her words. After that, Daphne asks Simon what he was going to say, but Simon seems not interested to continue his pending sentence. He then chooses to say that he doesn't recall. It is floating maxim of quality because we know that he is lying. Simon's expression obviously shows that he actually had something to say, but he shows a denial. What do you want, child? You should be in the chapel. What's that game called? You should be upstairs with the others. I don't want to be with the others. I want to know what that is you're playing. It's called chess. Will you teach me? I don't play, strangers. Beth Harmon finds an excuse to go downstairs because she is curious with what Mr. Scheibel does. When Mr. Scheibel asks her ask Beth a question since she's just standing right there silently, she doesn't answer his question directly. She even answers his question with another question. Her answer is interpreted as conversational implicature because it shows that she wants to stay there to know the game's name. Meanwhile, Mr. Seibel's utterance shows flouting maxim of relation, since his answer is irrelevant to Beth's question. To comply with cooperative principle of maxim of relation, the, the answer should have been it's called chess, just like at the end of the scene. Do you have a clock? No. We have a clock sharing system. If your opponent doesn't have one, come back to the desk and we'll loan you one. Play starts in 20 minutes. What's your rating? I don't have a rating. Have you ever played in a tournament before? No. Are you sure you want to do this? I'm sure. We don't have a women's section. I'll put you in beginners. I'm not a beginner. Doesn't matter. If you're an unrated player, you go in beginners with the people under 1,600. What's the price for beginners? 20. What about the other section? 
First prize in the open is 100. Is it against any rule for me to be in the open? Not exactly. Put me in the open. There are three guys in there with ratings over 1,800. And Beltic may show up. They will eat you alive. Beth is registering her first competition in the open and then happens a conversation between her and the twin. The conversation shows floating maxim of manner because the utterances of the twin, Matt and Mike, tend to show ambiguity. The twin note that Beth doesn't have a writing from the beginning she registers, but she eventually finds out that it's not against any rule for a beginner to be in the open. Instead of putting her in the open, one of them intimidates her that there will be three guys with high writing. The utterances of the twin are unclear and not coherent. Well, that's our analysis for the pragmatic assignment. We do hope this video could meet your expectation. Thank, Thank you for watching, stay healthy, and bye-bye!